Entering and returning to the room at this point, I just want to make a quick announcement to our contestants. Contestants for International Speech Contest, we are going to follow the same procedure that we did for the table topics, and that simply means we are going to mic you. So as you are waiting, and I see our first contestant is on deck right now. Who's our second contestant? Patrick is already up and he's ready and he understands. Melanie, you'll be number three, so good. We'll start micing you. I think we can get the first three contestants mic'd. And as you guys are getting mic'd, we know that we will have you going to the back of the room to be mic'd. And once you're done speaking, just return to the back of the room to have those mics taken from you as well. All right, that was a little dialogue to make certain that we could get everyone back into the room. We're getting back into the room. And since we have everyone back into the room, for the most part, we are now done with our 10-minute intermission. I want to thank you guys for your patience and for your participation in the Table Topic Contest. And we are now ready to begin our International Speech Contest. Before we start that, though, a little birdie whispered into my ear and said, if they say April showers bring May flowers, what does May bring? There you go, pilgrims. pilgrims. Did anyone else in the room do like I did? Uh huh. <laughs> so that was just a little April shower May May flower joke there to get us started with this second contest. I want to thank you again for coming into the room, and why don't we give this contest, let's open it up with a round of applause. As my pockets jingled, it reminded me about the cell phone, so I want to remind you about yours as well. If you had an opportunity to use your cell phones on break and you did not have a chance to turn it off, I do ask that you do put it on silent for this contest as well. We know that this is the international speech contest, so our contestants will be speaking a little bit longer than the first contest, and we do not want anything disturbing their speaking space. And speaking of speaking, we do have five contestants for this contest. I want to make certain that we have given you the speaking order. So if you would take out your program. I want to make certain that I provide you with the speaking order for the International Speech Contest. <clears throat> Contestant number one will be Mylinson <clears throat> Collins. Contestant number one will be Mylinson Collins. Contestant number two will be Patrick Stevenson. Contestant number two will be Patrick Stevenson. Contestant number three will be Melody Bird. Contestant number three will be Melody Bird. Contestant number four will be Abad Ab Ab Ashraf. And earlier today I said to Abad, I said, if you had to give me a signal of how to remember your name, he told me I could call him whatever, but I don't want to call him whatever. <laughs> Abad Ashraf will be contestant number four. And last but not least, our fifth contestant will be Ying Manison. Contestant number five will be Ying Manning. I said Manison. Manning. There we go, Ying. Thank you. See, I was looking to Ying to make sure I got his name correct as well. Perfect. Speaking order has been determined. Silencers have been placed on cell phones. Contestants and functionaries all know what they are doing for this contest. And with that, I would like to say, let the international speech contest begin. <laughs> Contestant number one, Mylison Collins. We are more alike than we will ever be different. We are more alike than we will ever be different, Mylison Collins. There, 
has been a storm looming within my heart for over 25 years. But tonight, it rains. It thunderstorms. It was May 2008. I'm standing there sweating, speaking my heart out to a class of felons at the Cook County Jail. In closing, I gave them a challenge. I said, just because you're within the confines of this jail does not mean you do not have the physical ability to change someone's life. Before anyone had the opportunity to say anything, some huge guy stood up. He looked like he had been swallowing dumbbells. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to find out real quick why you never disagree with a guy that got 50 years in jail, especially when you're in jail with him. <laughs> and he has a name like Billy Goat. <laughs> he stood up and he stared at me with a serious but placid look on his face. I thought that I was going to be afraid of his physical stature. But as it turned out, I was more so challenged by the challenge question that he gave me. Master Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests. So he challenged me. He stood up and said, what gives you the right to come in here and challenge us? You've never been through poverty. You've never been through struggle. You've never been without a father. My mind took me way back. 25 years worth of memories. I passed up some of the biggest memories of my life going back. My high school graduation prom. My very first kiss. Now that was a great memory. <laughs> it took me way back to when I was five years old. I remember there only being one bed in the house and a floor full of pallets. Me and my brothers used to sleep three at the top, three at the bottom, and someone would always dip into the middle. There were seven of us. My mama always gave us the bed, and she took the floor. You see, when you're five years old, you don't recognize poverty. You recognize love, family, and peace. But see, as time permeated through my life, I slowly but surely grew older. And I began to recognize the heart and the pain that fatherlessness had on family, both mentally and physically. I was 13 years old. Love and family was no longer good enough to keep me happy at home. And what was worse, my brothers that was older than me were 16 and 17, a perfect age for the street corner drug dealers. I have very vivid memories how my mom used to kick them, push them, pull them, trying to get them out of bed to go to school. But see, they had a hard time understanding why learning about Christopher Columbus and the square root of six was so important when there was much bigger problems back home, such as sleeping in bed, worrying about the sheriff department not evicting us, or how about running that long extension cord to the alley post in the back so we can have heat in the house. Even though my mama no longer run those extension cords today, those memories still run through my veins. Just keep working hard day in and day out. But the biggest memory of all, I'll never forget it. It was the winter of 1998. It was the coldest winter Chicago had ever seen. Again, we were without heat. I'll never forget walking into the bathroom, looking down. I couldn't urinate. The toilet water had froze. I told myself at that point, I will never allow this situation to continue. I will change my life. As my mind brought me back to the scene at the jail, I began to tell the story about how my brothers used to get shot and shot at, beat up, all in an attempt just to try to get out of poverty. Or on a deeper note, trying to play the role of a father. Billy Goat began to nod his head in agreement that I was giving it to him. Okay? It was as if we had became brothers going back and forth sharing notes. He said, did y'all used to use food, food stamps? I said, man, I used to wear a size six shoe and my bigger brothers used to wear a size 11. My mama made me wear them shoes to school. It was as if we became brothers right in front of each other's eyes. You see, we realized at that point we were more alike than we would ever be different. Slowly but surely, the entire room began to agree in unison. Fellas, we realized that we were more alike than we would ever be different. The echoes in unison started to agree, I, I, I. Was, 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 absence, absence, absence of a father as well. See, I began to realize a trend. 90% of the entire room shared the exact same story. Exact. We had became brothers. And when your brothers were people, you opened up to them. They too began sharing stories how they ran those electric cords. 
I remember thinking to myself, wait a minute, my mom invented that. Y'all got to pay her a fee. <laughs> they too share stories about how, how they wanted to get a good education. But drugs and gangs were the only viable solution. You see, they too share the same story, but they couldn't get out. It was at that point I realized I gave them the wrong story for the wrong group of people. I tried to backtrack, but the prison guard stopped me. Mylison, your time is up. We have to put them back into their cells. I was stuck. She began to rob them up, put them in a single file line, file them on out the back of the room. I watched the chains and shackles in the back of their head. My heart began to sing. I continued that speech in my heart. As they escorted me out on South California Street, and I continue that speech right here with you all. It was once said by Plato that you can always forgive a child for being afraid of the dark, but you can never forgive a grown man for being afraid of the light to be a father. It was once said by T.D. Jakes. He said he was having a father's conference at his church a long time ago. They were placing pins on all the fathers in the room. So many people came up to put place pins on them that he began to bleed, but he didn't stop them. He probably did not stop them for the simple fact that just like those pins that hurt it, fatherhood is a painful process. You got to stand there and fight. Just like some of single mothers, all too often we ask them to carry too much of the burden to carry the family. I say thank you to you all tonight. I say thank you to my mother who raised seven children by herself. But let's talk about the 2008 world champion of public speaking. LaShonda Rundles. She said in her winning speech, we would rather die than to have someone forget about us. And we don't want to fly away. All too often, all too often, we allow giants to not be there for us. Those giants are not fathers. We are more alike than we will ever be different. Master Toastmaster. Timers, can we have one minute of silence on the clock while the judges mark their ballot? Contestant number two, Patrick Stevenson. The relationship test. The relationship test, Patrick Stevenson. get that out there. And as a guy, the last thing I expect to learn when I'm watching a movie is a lesson in relationships. But Madam Contest Master, fellow Toastmasters, and our guest tonight, that is exactly what happened the last time I watched one of my favorites, Armageddon. <laughs> now those of you chuckling, well you're probably thinking, gee Patrick, isn't that the one with Bruce Willis and the asteroid and the spaceships? Yeah, 
That's right. If you haven't seen it, well, there's this asteroid, and it's on its way to destroy the Earth. And it's up to Bruce and his ragtag crew to fly up there and blow it out of the sky. Well, of course, they overcome every obstacle, including a few they create themselves, and in the end, they make it. They finally get to the asteroid, and they're about to finish the job. When something goes awry. Well, Bruce has to sacrifice himself for the sake of his daughter and her fiance. And as I'm watching Bruce say goodbye to his lovely daughter, I thought, just blow the thing! I didn't come here to watch this! But then I felt there was something a little mushy inside me. And I thought, huh, didn't see that one coming. But Armageddon got me twice. Turns out there's another guy on Bruce's crew, and he signed up to redeem himself in the eyes of his young son. And somehow he survives this suicide mission. At the end of the movie, when the two of them are reunited, that just put me over the edge. I'm doing this thing, stiff things. And I thought, really? Twice in one movie, Armageddon? That's when my wife walked in. She said, what are you watching, Patrick? I said, honey, you'll never believe this. I told her, and of course she said, isn't that the movie with Bruce Willis and the asteroid and the spaceships? So why would Armageddon do that to me? How can a movie do that? It demonstrates the relationship test. You can measure a relationship by how far you're willing to go for it. Think about the people in your life. Do you have someone for whom you would go all the way? I never really thought about that until my first child was born, my son, Kirby. And my sister, who already had a daughter, said, so Patrick, how does it feel? I said, feels great, fantastic, how else? And she goes, no, what I mean is, how does it feel to have someone for whom you would do anything? And something about the way she said the word anything made me realize this is no ordinary relationship that had just entered my world. Yeah, it's a struggle to raise kids. It's a trial. There's the misbehavior and how to address it. There's the messes that need to be cleaned up. There's all the things that just mysteriously break. But I wouldn't trade a minute of it, not one, to watch him grow, hear him laugh, have him call me dad. I haven't had to face that ultimate relationship test. But I think about it. And I tell you, it does not happen only in the movies. A few years ago, a young lady in the prime of her life, received a terrible diagnosis. She was told she had an advanced stage of cancer. And the doctor said she needed aggressive treatment. She was in the prime of her life with three daughters, a wonderful marriage, and yet she refused. Her husband pleaded with her. It turns out she was pregnant with the family's first son. Starting treatment required terminating the pregnancy. And she told her husband, yes, I may die, but our son is going to live. She had to tell her daughters that she had to do everything she could for their baby brother, Liam. Well, Lorraine continued the pregnancy, and after six months, her water broke. So 12 weeks premature, they delivered young Liam by cesarean procedure. Immediately, Lorraine went into treatment, Liam went into intensive care, and every day she got to hold him, she got to talk to him, she got to feed him. She would joke with the staff about which one of the two got more attention from the hospital. <laughs> and as he gained strength, she and her husband looked forward to the day they could bring him home. That day didn't arrive for Lorraine, she passed away before Liam could go home. And in, in that mountain of grief, the family's consolation was to look forward to Liam's arrival. And arrived he did. Not only did he go home, but he grew and he thrived as a young boy. From that sacrifice of Lorraine came the gift of Liam. 
I would like you to remember two thoughts tonight. First, that thing about me crying in Armageddon, mm -hmm. that's just between you and me, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay? We're good? Yeah. And number two, I hope that no one here ever has to face the test that Lorraine did. But I pray that should I ever be tested that way, that I have the strength to pass as Lorraine did. Madam Postman's Prayer. Mr. Timers, can we have one minute of silence on the clock so the judges can mark their ballots? Mr. Timers. Contestant number three, Melody Bird. My life as a college dropout. My life as a college dropout, Melody Bird. Charles Dickens novel. It is also the best description for my college years. Madam Contest Master, fellow Toastmasters and guests, let me take you back to 1983. I had just graduated from Mother Macaulay High School and I was on my way to the University of Illinois. I was 18 years old and I thought I was the smartest person I knew. Do you remember the summer after high school graduation? I do. It was carefree and full of laughter. That's how I thought my college days would go. And in the beginning, I was right. I easily balanced school life and personal life. Being a social butterfly, I decided to join a small sorority on campus. We only had seven members, but we were determined to grow. We took on marketing ourselves at local campus events. We promoted ourselves in the local school newspaper. But most of all, we partied. <laughs> Eventually, people began to notice us, and our <coughs> membership grew. By 1988, we had 25 members. They were sophomores and seniors with a variety of majors. By now, I had spent five years at the University of Illinois. <laughs> my best friend Rosalind was preparing to go to law school. My best friend Kim was preparing to go to medical school. What was I preparing for? I was preparing to lie. I had failed classes and flunked and even withdrew one semester. Graduation was not an option for me. The way I saw it, lying was my only way out. I planned it all out. I would take my final exams and then hurriedly move back home to Chicago. Later, I would tell everyone and complain about a graduation that I wasn't even invited to. After my final exam, I executed my plan without a hitch, or so I thought. When I arrived home, my mom knew something was going on especially because she wasn't invited to a graduation. 
However, she didn't say anything right away. My, strong, my small stature mom with a strong work ethic told me to start looking for a job. That's what I did. Every Sunday, I would go to the 7-Eleven. I would buy a big Chicago Tribune newspaper. Remember, this is the 80s. <laughs> I would take a red pen and I would circle all the jobs that I planned to apply for. I figured with five, uh, four years of college under my belt, I could get a good job. I sent out 20 to 30 resumes a week, and within a month, I got one interview. Later that night, as I sat on my bed, thinking about the interview, I looked at the newspaper strolling all across the floor. My resume sat atop unpacked boxes of college memorabilia. My resume suit and a crumple on my bed. My mom walked in and started with the questions. Hmm. How was the interview? The tears started immediately. It was okay, Mom, but the lady said to call her after I graduate. In reality, I had no idea when that was going to be. Then my mom asked me two questions that define the course of my life. What are you going to do? I want to go back to college and graduate. I don't want to be a dropout. Why do you want to do it? I want to get a good job and buy a blue car. <laughs> All right then, go back and graduate. And that's what I did. This time, I did it differently though. I didn't want to drop out twice. I actually skipped the party and I went to class. I finished the semester with one A and three Bs. The following semester, I completed an internship Within weeks of graduating, I landed a position at a local insurance company. I've been working in healthcare ever since. Now, I bet some of you have a story similar to mine. We love to start projects. It's so exciting. However, there are only a few of us that successfully complete all of our projects. Next time you're considering starting a project, I want you to ask yourself the two questions my mom asked me. What are you going to do? And why do you want to do it? Answer very carefully and clearly because vagueness paves the path to failure. Believe me, I know. So if you're thinking about starting a project soon, think about those two questions. And also do two other things once you decide to move forward. Commit and not quit. Madam Contest Master. Mr. Timers, can we have one minute of silence on the clock while the judges mark their ballots? Thank you, Mr. Simons. Contestant number four, Abad Ashraf. Life is time. <clears throat> Life is time, Abad Ashraf. The sun rose and fell today. Let's take time to reflect on the world. 
I will speak about history. You will learn why history repeats itself, and you will decide how will you be remembered in history. Dear Toastmasters, Toastmistresses, and honored guests, as a leader, I learned over time, anger should not be responded with anger. Reflecting on the moments I was angry in my lifetime led me to a deep philosophical question. What is the meaning of life? Life is time. Time is running out. Some of you may be thinking, people pretend to be petulant and dismissive monarchs. They will not change. What's the point? I once heard a saying which still brings hope to me. Omnes pro omnibus, unes pro uno. It means one for all and all for one. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. One for all and all for one. It's a timeless quote from the Three Musketeers. <clears throat> To me, one for all means one for God. My fate tells me all within one is God. I couldn't run from tomorrow. One day I had to face my life without anger. Life is time. Let's all calm down. Now I understand this world is full of sheep and wolves, as how, how, how I describe it. The shepherd keeps the sheep calm. For his benefit, the wolf hunts the sheep one by one to eat. I believed I was different. I am different. So there was a problem. I realized over time that this world is a place where the powerful get away with whatever they want, and that's just the way it really is. Life is time. It's over when God says it's over. For those of you who are warriors at heart, who like to fight every day in life, work hard. There once was a boy who was fearless. In ancient Rome, as a Roman general was parading through the streets, this boy was tasked with reminding the general that although at his peak, peak today, Tomorrow, he could fall, or more likely, be brought down. It is further possible that the servant may have instead advised, Respis posti, hominum te esse momento, momento mori, which means, look behind you, remember that you are but a man, remember that you'll die. The moral of the story is, life is time, death is certain. 25 centuries ago, a hero suffered death through an unjust judgment. He stood in front of the Greek council to be judged for teaching the youth to become corrupt and evil. Socrates was a man who asked questions. What is absolute good? What is absolute evil? What is absolute truth? In a world where they put a man to death for believing in a happier world, Socrates was put to death. On his last day, he asked the council for a favor. And this is why history repeats itself. Because people are opportunistic. They, they choose whatever is expedient at the moment. They don't care about their values, they don't care about what is right, they care about what is what's the most benefit for me. He said, I have a favor to ask of you. When my sons are grown up, if they care about riches or anything more than virtue, if they pretend to be something when they are really nothing, for not caring about, for what they ought to care for, trouble them as I trouble you. Confucius, the father of Eastern philosophy, agreed with Socrates, the father of Western philosophy. His story was told to a boy who one day would change the world. So began the legend of Alexander the Great, the student of Aristotle, the student of Plato, the student of Socrates. Socrates said, 
What is the problem with the world? I have a solution. For all the problems in the world, the solution is one for all and all for one. Thank you, Mr. Timer. Contestant number five, Yi Benin. Jump. Jump. Contestant number five, Yi Benin. towards the door. The door opens. You're getting ready to attempt your first skydive. One thought comes in mind. Two words that cripple mankind's ambition, goals, and any achievement worthwhile in life. I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, have you ever talked yourself into something and talked yourself right out of it? <laughs> By the show of hands. <laughs> How did I get into this predicament? For 27 years of my life, I've been scared, I've been passive, I've been timid. I used to hide behind groups, sit in the back of the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the answer, and I still wouldn't raise my hand. And I took that into my adulthood life. <clears throat> Luckily, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon.com, we have a such thing called personal development. And I read a few books, and all those books said similar things. Face your fear. Jump over things. Get out of your comfort zone. So I decided I need to do something with myself. Because one day, I will not be here. I've been scared of heights, scared of girls, <laughs> scared of everything else. But I'm not scared to die. Because one day I will. Sky die. That's how you do it. I drove an hour and a half to Ottawa, Illinois. Took a 30 minute class. I signed my signature on a waiver form. <laughs> what do you think the waiver form said? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you might not make it. 
but I've been hiding behind that chair, that podium, that weakness for so long. I couldn't do it anymore. So yes, 15,000 feet in the air, I crawled on my knees. I looked down. I said, I can't. <coughs> but it's that one person on your left, which is you. The other you, not that you, <laughs> the other you. <laughs> Aren't you tired of being a loser? Aren't you tired of not living to your full potential? Aren't you tired of just putting yourself in a cage that doesn't exist? And don't you see those two girls behind you? <laughs> don't you know? If they jump and you don't, <laughs> And you see them in the parking lot. <laughs> They're pretty. And that's an ugly situation. <laughs> I said to myself, you know what? You're right. And I remember taking that class, that 30 minute class. I remember three things ready, set, and jump. So this is exactly what I did. I told my instructor, I'm ready. Ready, set, jump. Woo! <laughs> For 60 seconds, I couldn't remember anything, but <laughs> I pulled the parachute at 7,000 feet and I started to reflect. Whoa! I did it. I'm halfway there. Is that my car right there? <laughs> Is that the highway I took? Is that the airport? He tapped my shoulders. I'm going to pull it. We're going to land. I landed. Wow. I went skydiving. I took that jump. Will skydiving help you to become successful? No. <laughs> Jumping will. <laughs> Joining Toastmasters. You want to lose 100 pounds? Let's do it one pound at a time, 100 times. Your club is in trouble, it needs a president. Losing in a competition at a club level, picking yourself up, doing it again. Jumping leads to everything you want to do in life. I have one question for you. One, are you still up there? Hey, what are you waiting for? You prepared, you're ready, <clears throat> jump, Madam Chair. Judges can mark their ballots, <coughs> and that means for all of us to give them that opportunity <coughs> to have a side.
Madam Postmaster, we have all the ballots. <clears throat> that competed tonight in both the Table Topics Contest as well as the International Speech Contest. Why don't I first allow the Table Topic contestants to come up onto the stage, and if you could line up on the stage according to the order in which you competed, that would be perfect. Test, and that's because she had to leave early. So what I would like to do is to go ahead and interview those that are here. And I'm basically going to ask some standard questions of all of you guys, tossing in a different question or two for each of you. All right? John, I'll start with you. Tell us what club you represent and how long you've been in Toastmasters. I represent Chicago Toastmasters, actually right across the street. And I joined in November, I want to say. So I actually, I think December. About five months I've been in the club. Okay. about five months. I won't ask you what certifications you've achieved thus far, unless you've been Speedy Gonzalez and you have quite some achievements. Not, That's okay. Not yet. That's okay. You do have an achievement, though. You competed in tonight's contest. Yeah. Give them a <laughs> John, as I'm looking at your list here, your bio, your profile, something that really strikes me which does go in alignment with the fact that you've only been a member for about five months, and although you don't have a CL or an ALB or any of those acronyms behind your name, something that you say really inspires you are results. And I think that you are demonstrating that today. Yet let me ask for you to elaborate a little bit more on that. Why do you say that results is what inspires you? Well, it's a great question. And Luckily, I was asked that question at the the uh, prior competition. So rehearse. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> rehearse. So what I had answered it then is that at the end of the day, what is there without results? And I equated it to exercise, and I'm sure the gentleman here who talked about weightlifting can can attest to the fact that exercise is something that you have to basically do for six weeks before you can actually look in the mirror and say, "Wow, I see a result." And Without those results, there's nothing to keep you going. So that's why results are really, at the end of the day, what inspires me. Without results, why, why get up in the morning? Wow. Would you say that you actually acquired some results from being into tonight's contest? Yeah, I, it, uh, they were painful, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I got them. Good. Well, John, on behalf of Central North Division and the contest chair, Bill Muriel, as well as all of us here tonight that helped to put this contest on, I would like to present you with this speech contest certificate of participation for the spring 2013 Central North Table Topics Contest. Congratulations. Thank you. I get a chance to see you and chat with you again. So let me ask you the same question that I started off asking John. What club do you represent and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I represent uh, Talk of the Tower at uh, Tribune Tower uh, 6356. I've been a member there since uh, July when uh, my uh, colleague Tracy Rudd became president. And then previously I lived in Indianapolis and was a member of Toast of the Tower down there for about two years, one of the five years. Wow. So almost oh, three years good. now. Good. So the names of the Toastmaster Clubs are all awesome. Yes. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Now, Patrick, as I'm looking at your profile here, something that jumps out at me are listed in your interests and your hobbies. You say here that you're interested in reading, writing, singing, and word games and puzzles. Out of the four of those that you have listed here, which one do you really enjoy the most? Singing. Singing. That, that, that just, yeah. I sing with my church, and one of the things we say there is singing is praying twice. 
yeah. so, um, <laughs> I like that part of it on the face side, but otherwise singing just always lifts people's spirits. It makes you feel good, it takes you to a different place, you get to exercise your vocal cords, which helps here. Um, it's, it's fun. <laughs> See, they are reading my mind. So Patrick, if there was anything that you wanted to sing for us tonight to help us walk out of this room with, what is it you would share with us? Give us a... a, a well, I already did We Shall Overcome, right? I mean, <laughs> good for today's anniversary. Uh, how about zippity doo da? We all know that, right? zippity doo da, zippity yay. There we go. Oh, my, what a wonderful day. Here we go. It's a Toastmaster. All right, for the young at heart, let's see who knows this. Por favor, manténganse a la de las puertas. Please stand clear of the door. From? The CTA trains. Yeah, but young at heart. It's true, yes. <laughs> but it was made popular at Walt Disney World, the monorail. Oh. Now, what you guys don't know is that I had an opportunity to chat with Patrick earlier today. He was making the attempt to catch a train, so I presented him with his certificate at that point. But I did want to have an opportunity to allow you to do what I want to do at this point, and that's to provide him with a round of applause for... Blue Cross Blue Shield Toastmaster Club One. I've been a founding member and I've been a member for two years. Nice. Any certifications? I have my uh, CL and my half CC. I've also competed in three contests. And one of my most proudest moments was getting my half confident. I bragged about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Give him a round of applause. you said you said my half cc was one of my proudest moments i bragged on that you have your competent leader your cl you've also competed in three toastmaster contests were those all at the club level or some club and area some club and area some club and area not bad now jesse i'm looking here it says what inspires you you simply say tomorrow yes it does mm -hmm. tell us more well, <clears throat> tomorrow is the ability to correct everything you did wrong today. Mm. So there's always a duel. <laughs> always a do-over. Food for thought for you? Mm -hmm. I know it's food for thought for me. Jesse Graham, I want to present you also with a certificate of attendance, or a certificate of attendance. <laughs> <laughs> certificate of participation for tonight's Table Topic Contest. Congratulations. <laughs> and Jesse, I'm glad I didn't have to wait until tomorrow to have that duo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Vincent Del Toro, tell us what club you represent. How long have you been a member? I'm a member of Ying Menin's Toastmasters of Lincoln Park. <laughs> uh, to excuse me. <laughs> Toast <laughs> Michigan Avenue Toastmasters. Yeah. That's my other <laughs> Michigan Avenue Toastmasters for 10 months. Oh, wow, that. Have you acquired any certifications as of yet? I have no certifications. I don't have my CC yet, so technically that makes me an incompetent communicator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say so much incompetent communicator because you've been a member for 10 months and you've been able to compete in a contest. Is this your first contest? This is actually my second contest. Uh, back in November, I believe, I placed second for the evaluation contest. All right. Nice. There were only two participants. But what I do appreciate that you shared here is that you 
are inspired by musicians. You're inspired by musicians. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Absolutely. I think I wanted to choose something specific, but then I thought, how about something broad that we can all relate to? So I might have a favorite musician. I like this guy named Mitch Allen. He does this punk rock called SR71. But everyone has their favorite musicians. Musicians who just make you feel so amazing. And it's because they take all this stuff, all this life, all these experiences that people have had, whether in the prison, or whether growing through poverty, or whether 2,500 years ago with Socrates, and they condense it into a five minute song. It's just amazing. <laughs> not bad, not bad. <laughs> now, you know I'm curious in finding out as you were going through lifting weights and building up muscles, did you have a special song that inspired you to go through that process? Actually, I did. There's a song called Remember the Name by by Fort Minor. Uh, the lead singer was from Lincoln Park, I think, but it's a very big workout song. It's heavy bass. It really gets you pumped up. All right. Well, I'm glad you were pumped up enough tonight to participate in this contest, and I want to present you also with a certificate of participation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Patrick Stevenson. Let us know what club you're representing tonight and how long you've been a part of Toastmasters. I'm here with uh, Downtown Club South Loop Speed Freaks, and I've been a Toastmaster since 2003 now. Mm, right. <laughs> Certifications? I am an Advanced Communicator Bronze and an Advanced Leader Bronze, so I still have a bit of a track for the ETM. Not bad, but you have started that process. And something that I've noticed also here, Patrick, that you have listed is with your interests. You say that you, one of them, you've listed camping and also scouts. Are That's they right. They, in fact, they are very related. My son, who I mentioned, is in scouts now. And I wasn't able to be in scouts for a time during my childhood. I was a child of a single mom. And didn't have some of those scouting uh, opportunities. And my son started in Cub Scouts. I can say for the first couple of years, I had to make him go to meetings. But eventually he got around to it and he wanted to go to them. And we went on our first camping trip together this past summer up on the Wisconsin River. Beautiful trip, nice, shallow, easy water, and you can camp on the sand dunes in the middle of the river. And I'm talking to one of the other dads there. I said, boy, you know, I actually made sure my son was going to be here so we could go camping together, but I never did that. He's like, you know, that's why I made some of my son join this thing, too. Mm -hmm. uh. And I know tonight your speech title was the relationship test. You had a sound spike with camping and scouts. You definitely have the relationship building as an integral part of who you are and what you do with your family and with your I son. hope so. Good. Patrick, congratulations for tonight and thank you for your <laughs> more interviews to do before we open them. Let's interview our table, or our international, our international speech contestants. Please come and line up on the stage in the order in which you participated. <laughs> for the International Speech Contest represented. Let me start with Miles and Collins. Miles, and tell us what club you're representing and how long you've been involved. I'm um, representing on top of the Tower of Club <coughs> from, uh, I've been in for a long time. I forget, like, I was something like 17. That's it, I was a, you know, my, I, I, anything being getting out, you know, Miles Tower. So, it's, it's, it's like a million different clubs, like, just, you know. Yeah, how long so, have you been in the club you in right now? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, sure. Now, as I'm looking at your profile, Milestone, something that I'm noticing.
seeing is that it's sharing here that you are self-employed, is yeah, it? That's right. Yeah. Tell us exactly what you're doing. Definitely. Uh, I started my own um, financial advisory company. Uh, you know, we trade stocks, uh, financial advice. I mean, all, all things financial. You know, life insurance, health insurance, financial advice, retirement planning, things of that nature. It's oh. The name of my company is called Collins Financial. Collins Financial. Now, if you had to leave us with one word of wisdom regarding financial advice, what would it be for tonight? Patience. You know, uh, America is in debt right now because you don't have patience. Uh, one of my personal mentors who lives, he owns a, a million dollar financial company. You know, we talk all the time, it's just America don't have patience. When you see everything we get, it's patience. Mm. And planning, patience and planning. All right. Well, since you've been involved since you were 17, I guess you have a lot of patience. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Maya said, thank you so much for competing in tonight's international speech contest. And this is your certificate of participation. <laughs> of the interviews because he did tabletop things. Yeah, we already know what club he's representing. We already know how long he's been involved. Yeah, I want to toss out another question to Patrick here. Patrick, since you have been involved in Toastmasters since the early 2000s, what's the greatest lesson that you gathered or gained from your involvement with the organization? Well, I got to say it is to come out of that shell. I, Toastmasters transformed me from being that introvert, the person that kind of stayed behind the crowd and let someone else answer and let someone else take the spotlight. There is no reason not to take advantage of the opportunities that you have. And this organization has given me a plethora of opportunities. I certainly resonated with the speech tonight. Jump out of your shell, get out there. Life does not last forever. All right. Well, with that being said, Patrick, here's your certificate of participation. For you. <laughs> Ms. Melody Bird, tell us what club you're representing and how long you've been involved. I've been a member of Millennium Park Toastmasters, club number 6667, since July 2010. All right. Any certifications thus far? CC and CL. All right. What I like here that you have listed as your favorite quote is, change your conversation, change your life. Mm. <coughs> Why did you put that particular <laughs> quote? Because you could have placed anything yeah. on this list. Why that particular quote? Change your conversation, change your life. Because that's how I changed my life. I actually took coursework through Landmark Education and they showed me that you can change can't to can, you can change no to yes, and you can see all things possible. So first, it starts in the mind. Think it, and then it starts with conversation. Change your conversation, and you can change your life. Not bad. Well, now what Melody doesn't remember is that I remember her from our days at U of I. And when she told the story about her being focused and not partying so much, she told the truth. <laughs> she told the truth. By the time I met her, I do believe that she had gone through that rebound period, that focus period, that change period. And what she demonstrated in tonight's speech was that she really embraces that quote, change your conversation, change your life. Yet you were able to answer that question first that your mom asked you in order to get your life in order. Yeah. So you would not be a college dropout. Right. So thank you for sharing your story tonight in the International Speech Contest, and this is your certificate of anticipation. <laughs> Abad Ashraf, tell us who you're representing tonight and how long you've been a part of that club. I joined Panda Express Telespaces on a Friday evening when I thought that I wanted to really become a person who would like to speak in front of people. Ooh. I've been a member for about five months now. Okay. Wow. You know what's amazing to me is that you remember it was a Friday night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm usually doing something on Friday night. <laughs> Moments is there. As I'm looking at your profile, I like your quote here. You said, what inspires you the most is trust and hope. 
trust and hope. Why that particular phrase? Um, I know a lot about things I shouldn't reveal to the world, and I shouldn't speak on matters that don't pertain to people's knowledge. So I just believe that we can change the world, and we can really believe in what we want to believe in as long as we still believe in it. And that's how I want to answer that question. <laughs> all, right, all right, all right. You know what, you're a deep brother. On a Friday night, we need to hang out so I can find out more. <laughs> Thank you so much for your participation in today. I know what club you're part of. Although, I want you to tell it again. Everyone, Ying, Manin, tell us what club you represent, how long you've been in part. Uh, beautiful Drake Hotel, <laughs> Tuesday evening, every Tuesday, 6.30, Michigan Avenue Toastmasters, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Come enjoy the magical moment of Michigan Avenue Toastmasters. <laughs> He was marketing, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Although when I look down, I see that your office that you're holding, is it currently the president yes. of the club? Not bad. Chunk. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, talk about Chunk. Now let me ask you this, Sheen. From your list, I know your notable accomplishments. You have your competent communicator. Are you close to another certification right now? Yes. Uh, my deadline is June for to get my CC so we can get our points. <laughs> <laughs> Change conversation, change life. <laughs> One other question, Ying, that I have for you here. In your story, when you talked about that journey that you took when you went down to Ottawa, Illinois, and you took that jump class, and you gave us that philosophy about not being afraid to hide behind the podium and to actually get out there and jump. When you were describing some of the instances with Toastmasters, were you talking about yourself personally or those around you that you've observed? Well, Toastmasters really saved my life because you're around people who they want to grow, they want to better themselves, and you know, I believe in energy. So every time I'm in that room at 6 30 or a conference, like I feel that energy. Like, all right, when you walk to the car at the end of the event, you need to do something with yourself because you're not going to be here forever. And this is all rental, you know, your, your flesh, your home, your everything is, you're not going to take with you. And, you know, like I listen to Tony Robbins a lot and he has this thing called a rocking chair moment. And I've really been living my life with this rocking chair moment where if I'm in a rocking chair when I'm 90 years old, I don't want to regret anything. I want to smile and I say, you know what? I did that competition. I tried the table topics. I did this. <laughs> and I'm okay with it. I'm living. So that's what I've been doing for a year now. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your message with us tonight and for giving us all the memories and for reminding us about our rocking chair moment. Mm -hmm. Because you participated in tonight's international speech contest, you gave us food for thought for the other side of the door today. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Chair to get him to come forward. Hasn't our contest master done a great job tonight? Yeah. Toastmasters is a great place to learn, a great place to get coaching, and a great place to share communication. Let's welcome our videographer for a quick two minute information. Tim. thank Paul Racino for covering for me tonight. He's think he's been doing a good job on the footage. We've got all the division contests covered and we'll have them all covered. Yeah. Oh There's over three years of contest footage from division level and above 
available at www.timsvideo.com. Over 300 hours of Toastmasters content. See me, I have cards afterwards. This will be ready. These contests will be available after the conference. It'll be publicly available to the YouTube account for free. And I'll let's see what I can do about a high-res DVD distribution later on. Thank All you. Right, Tim. My goal was to finish right around 8.15 and we're right there. Just a little bit of etiquette how we're going to do the announcing of the winners and the presentations. If you have been a district officer, such as an area governor or division governor or in the past, or this year, can you raise your hand? Okay, if you're not a contestant, I'd like you to line up back over by Linda. We're going to have a receiving line of our district officers, past and current. So if you guys can stand in the back over there, our current district officers and past district officers. And we have Ethel and Don, our district P&O and division governor, come up here to help at the front for our front receiving line. So Ethel and Don, come on up. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask Don and Ethel to take a first and second place trophy and a third place trophy. We're going to announce the winners. The third place winner is going to stand here on the stage. Stay here. Then the second place winner, the first place winner, Heather, raise your hand. She's going to take some pictures. After the three trophies have been presented, I want everybody who competed in Table Topics to go to the back of the room and shake hands. You guys were leaders tonight. Win or lose, you have won our hearts. You have won the time of communicating. And I want the leaders of our district and our division to congratulate you whether you have a trophy or not. So again, directions, we're going to present the first, second, third place trophies. You get a certificate from the contest master. First, second, third people stay up here. Heather will take the pictures. After the picture's over, everybody competed. Go to the back of the line to get the leadership handshake for the great job you've done. And let's give them one more round of applause for the great job. It is now time to announce the winners of the Table Topics Contest for tonight. Starting with third place, she's not represented yet, Ava Tony Snyder. representing Patrick. And if we can have a drum roll, please. Our first place winner for the Spring 2013 Central North Division Table Topic Contest is Patrick Stevenson.
International Speech Contest, and we're starting with third place. Our third place winner for the Spring 2013 Central North Division International Speech Contest is Mylison Collins. Let's hear it for them as well. 